So good morning and welcome everybody to When Solicitors Go Rogue, which sounds like a Channel 5 show that should be hosted by Paddy McGuinness, uh, but is in fact the latest in our Cover Talk bite sized webinar series. And today we're going to be looking at the impact of dishonesty uh, on solicitors' professional negligence claims and their cover. Um, joining me today is my colleague, Adrian Quintner. Adrian is a senior associate in our Manchester Insurance Disputes team. And for those of you who don't know me already, I'm Neil Howes and I'm a partner here at Mills and Reeve. And um, a couple of things before we kick off. Um, this session is being recorded and whilst you can see us, we can't see you. Um, we should have a little bit of time at the end for a Q&A session. Um, and so if you have any questions, then please post those in the chat box, the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And my colleague Harriet Strevens is going to be picking those up for us at the end. If we don't get to your question, please don't worry. We will try our very best to answer those questions by email over the next couple of days. So today's talk all about dishonesty. Uh, hopefully every bit as entertaining as the Wagatha Christie style, but uh, let's see. Over the next 20 minutes, we're going to be having a quick look at how the SRA's minimum terms and conditions for solicitors' PI policies deal with dishonesty. We're going to be taking a bit of a look at what dishonesty is and how the courts assess whether someone has acted dishonestly. Then we're going to have a look at the coverage implications for insured where uh, dishonesty or fraud might be alleged. And we're going to finish off by having a look at some of the key things that insurers need to be thinking about and considering when assessing cover for claims involving dishonesty and fraud allegations. So, Adrian, I'm going to hand over to you. Um, obviously, Solicitor's Profession Indemnity Insurance, subject to minimum terms and conditions set down by the SRA. So how do those minimum terms and conditions uh, deal with the issue of dishonesty? Um, well, Neil, whatever your profession, you can't get insurance for your own fraud or dishonesty. Such cover is excluded as a matter of public policy. It just wouldn't be right if you could be indemnified against the adverse consequences of your own deliberate wrongdoing. So professional indemnity policies will always contain some sort of clause excluding cover for claims involving fraud or dishonesty. But some policies will nevertheless provide cover for both the firm itself and its innocent partners if a claim involving dishonesty is made by a client. In other words, the dishonest partner won't be covered, but the innocent partners and the firm itself will be covered. Solicitor's PI insurance is one example of this. This helps ensure that clients are protected and reflects the SRA's focus on the consumer. All solicitor's PI policies have to comply with a set of minimum terms and conditions, the MTC, laid down by the SRA. Every solicitor's PI policy must also contain a term to the effect that if a provision in the policy is inconsistent with the MTC, then the MTC will prevail. Clause 6.8 of the MTC is the key provision on fraud and dishonesty. This states that the insurer may exclude cover of a particular person to the extent that any civil liability or related defence costs arise from fraud or dishonesty committed or condoned by that person. But it sets out two exceptions. First, the insurance must cover each other insured person. Second, the insurer can't treat the company or LLP as dishonest unless the dishonesty was committed or condoned by all directors of the company or all members of the LLP. In other words, an insurer will have to prove that all of the firm's principles were complicit in the dishonesty. This ties in with clause 4.2 of the MTC, which is a special condition. It provides that the insurer can't reduce or deny its liability on any grounds except where one of the exclusions contemplated by clause six applies. This includes clause 6.8, which we've just looked at. Other special conditions include clause 4.1, which states the insurer can't avoid or repudiate the insurance, even on the grounds of a fraudulent misrepresentation to the insurer. 
and Clause 4.9, which provides that the insurer must pay the defence costs of an insured who is alleged to have committed or dis condoned dishonesty or fraud. But it doesn't have to pay any defence costs incurred after the insured has admitted committing or condoning the dishonesty or fraud or a court or other judicial body finds the insured was guilty of such dishonesty or fraud, whichever is the earlier. Clause 7.2 is an important general condition. This entitles the insurance to provide that each insured who committed or condoned dishonesty or fraud will reimburse the insurer to the extent that is just and equitable having regard to the prejudice caused to the insurer's interests. But under clause 4.4, the insurer can't set off any reimbursement due to it by the dishonest insured against any amount payable by the insurer to a claimant. And a corporate entity is not required to reimburse its insurer unless the dishonesty was committed or condoned by all of the directors or members. So that's an overview of the relevant MTC clauses. Neil will now look at what is dishonesty. Thanks, Adrian. So as Adrian was saying, the MTC talks about dishonesty, but it doesn't actually define uh, what it means. To do that, we've got to go to the case law. Um, and the key case to have a look at is the Supreme Court's judgment in Genting, uh, against Ivy. Um, a really interesting case this. Uh, Mr Ivy was a high stakes gambler uh, who managed to win over £7 million at a casino over the course of a 24 hour period using a really complex technique called edge sorting. And I can't go into too much detail, loads of videos on YouTube if you want to find out more, but that basically means trying to spot minuscule differences in the edges of manufactured playing cards so that you can get a gain over the casino or the house. So he won over £7 million and then, of course, the casino refused to pay on the basis that they said that edge sorting was cheating. So he took them to court and the court made its way right up to the Supreme Court. And interestingly, he didn't deny that he'd used this technique called edge sorting. But in Mr Ivey's view, he said, well, as far as I was concerned, this was a perfectly legitimate technique, even though it does give me an edge over the house. Um, and for that reason, I can't have acted dishonestly. And he said dishonesty was an essential part of cheating. Therefore, he couldn't have cheated. That caused uh, the Supreme Court to look again and to revisit the judicial test for dishonesty in civil cases. And this is where they landed. So the first thing to remember is that dishonesty is a state of mind. So the first stage that the court has to apply uh, when assessing whether somebody has acted dishonesty is to ascertain the defendant's actual state of knowledge or belief as to the facts. And then at stage two, the court has to decide whether in light of that state of mind, the defendant's conduct was dishonest or honest by the standards and objective standards of ordinary decent people. So the critical point here is that there's no requirement that a person must appreciate that what they've done is dishonest by the standards of ordinary decent people. In other words, you can't escape a finding of dishonesty simply by saying that you genuinely didn't believe that you were doing something wrong. As the Supreme, uh, as the court put it in a different case, Barlow, Close and Eurotrust, but this was a statement reaffirmed by the Supreme Court in Genting, um, whilst dishonest, dishonest state of mind is a subjective mental state, the standard by which the law determines whether it's dishonest is objective. And whilst I appreciate that's a bit of a head spinner, when you sit down and think about it, that must be right. So that's the test. Um, there's a couple of other points that I just wanted to mention. A question that we get asked quite a lot is whether gross negligence or recklessness is enough to prove dishonesty. The short answer to that is no. Gross negligence certainly isn't enough, simply because you're really, really bad at something, or frankly, you're an idiot, doesn't make you dishonest. Likewise, recklessness might be an indicator that somebody has acted dishonestly, but recklessness on its own 
isn't sufficient. It's also worth highlighting that dishonesty doesn't always involve a positive act. You can be uh, guilty of blind eye knowledge. Uh, that means effectively looking the other way. Now, the law in this area is quite complicated, particularly on how much you actually need to know and be aware of. But the two key things to be, be aware of and that the court are going to look at are as follows. Firstly, blind eye knowledge involves the existence of a firmly grounded suspicion, which is targeted on specific facts that may exist, a mere speculative suspicion, for example, that's not gonna be enough. Secondly, it involves a conscious decision not to take any steps to confirm the existence of those facts. And finally, just a quick word about the standard of proof in civil cases when assessing dishonesty. Again, a lot of judicial debates about this over the years, but the test is the normal one. So whilst cogent evidence is always required in order to prove dishonesty, the standard of proof is the balance of probabilities and nothing more. Back to you, Adrian. Thanks, Neil. So we're going to look now at what are the cover implications for an insured when dishonesty is alleged. The greatest potential impact is when dishonesty is alleged against a sole practitioner. That leaves them with the prospect of being left without cover if the dishonesty is proven. For firms with a small number of partners, there's also the possibility of being left without cover if it transpires that they colluded in the dishonesty or had blind eye knowledge. In other words, it doesn't matter that they didn't actively commit the dishonesty. It's enough for the insurer to show they condoned the dishonesty. For example, a firm's partner is asked by a corporate client to make payments out of its client account amounting to 15 million euros. He receives 170,000 pounds out of the account as a personal fee and conceals this. The payments are in fact part of a scheme to launder money in a 100 million euro fraud. The, the partner doesn't have actual knowledge of the fraud. This is a real case, Group 7 versus Nazir, mentioned by Neil. In this case, the partner was an accountant member of a multidisciplinary firm of solicitors. The Court of Appeal found he satisfied the test of blind eye knowledge because first, his receipt and concealment of the £170,000 fee means he must have had clear suspicions that the payments were part of a fraud. And second, he consciously decided to refrain from taking any step to confirm the true state of affairs for fear of what he might discover. In all of these cases, there will be cover for defence costs incurred up to the point the insured has admitted the dishonesty or a judicial body finds they were dishonest. Even if cover is confirmed to the firm and it's in innocent partners, that still leaves the partner or employee accused of dishonesty facing the prospect of a recovery action. On top of that, the person accused of dishonesty faces the prospect of regulatory action by the SRA and in the most serious of cases, criminal prosecution. One final point, if there are several claims concerning a series of transactions which might involve dishonesty, aggregating the claims means the insured will not pay more than one excess. The downside for the insured is it will then be financially exposed if the value of the claim exceeds the indemnity limit. Now, I, I know we're all sick to death of aggregation, but it's worth bearing in mind the case of Lord Bishop of Leeds versus Dixon, Coles and Gill. Here, the Court of Appeal compared an insur uh, compelled an insurer to pay more than the indemnity limit in respect of a partner's thefts of over £4 million from several clients' accounts. The policy had a £2 million limit for any one claim in line with clause 2.1 of the MTC and contained an aggregation clause in line with clause 2.5A2 of the MTC, enticing the insurer to regard all claims against the insured arising from one series of related acts or omissions as one claim. But the court rejected the insurer's argument that the partner's dishonesty was the connecting cause of the loss and held the acts of theft were not a series of related acts. 
The fact they were made by the same person was not enough to aggregate the losses. The case is fact specific. Here the facts work to the insured's advantage because the two million pound indemnity limit was available for each of several claims. Um, I'm now going to hand back over to Neil, who will take us through some key points to consider when assessing cover. Thanks, Adrian. Um, so from an insurer's perspective, there are quite a number of things that you need to consider uh, when assessing whether there is cover for a claim involving an allegation of dishonesty or fraud. And the key thing I think you need to bear in mind, and as we've already touched upon, is that you are not going to be able to decline cover unless there is clear evidence that all of the partners in the firm either acted dishonestly, dishonesty, or either condoned the dishonesty of another. So where you've got, for example, a large law firm, say you've got 100 partners, there is usually no question that the firm is going to be entitled to cover. At the other end of the scale, of course, you might have an insured who is a sole practitioner and the focus there is very much on whether he or, or she acted dishonestly. In the middle and sometimes the trickiest cases to assess are cases where you've got maybe two or three partners in a firm. You may have clear evidence that one of the partners had acted dishonestly, but the question is always whether the other partners in the firm were either complicit in that or whether they turned a blind eye. You also, of course, have an obligation to treat all of your customers fairly. So before taking any decisions on coverage, you will need to make sure that you've undertaken a thorough and proper coverage investigation. That's normally going to culminate in something called an indemnity conference, normally conducted by council, where the insured is invited to attend doesn't have to attend if they don't want to. The purpose of that conference is really to question the insured's partners separately about the evidence which has been gathered in the investigation and also for the insured to put forward their version of events and anything else that they might want you to take into account. And once you've held your indemnity conference, you then uh, need to reach a decision on cover. In some cases, of course, coverage investigations can be conducted quite quickly. In other cases, they can take um, certainly a number of months. Um, some years ago, I was involved in a case involving an alleged mortgage fraud ring, at which a partner in a firm of solicitors was alleged to have been involved. So that coverage investigation involved us having to analyze patterns of behavior across over 90 transactions. Uh, we then had to look at whether the partner's behavior had been dishonest. On top of that, we then needed to establish exactly what the other partners in the firm knew about the dishonest partners practices and whether they had condoned or turned a blind eye to the dishonest behavior. So that is not the kind of thing that's gonna get completed in a couple of weeks. It's also worth highlighting that whilst the examples we've referred to today primarily focus on financial frauds, um, exactly the same principles apply to other cases where dishonesty is alleged. In fact, dishonesty doesn't even have to have been expressly alleged for you to investigate cover if you think that dishonesty may have been committed. So in terms of the key things that I think it would be worth bearing in mind uh, when looking at cover, uh, don't forget about the following. Firstly, if you think that dishonesty is going to be an issue, make sure that you reserve your rights from the outset and be clear with your insured about the steps that you are going to take. Don't forget that you are still responsible for paying the insurer's defence cost while that investigation takes place and potentially, of course, beyond that as well. It's also really important that the insured's position is protected whilst you carry out your coverage investigation. That, of course, means that your own position is protected if you're required to cover the claim later on down the line. So you therefore uh, need to make sure that you're instructing two separate firms of solicitors one on the coverage side to do your investigation and one on the defence side. Conflicts of interest mean that one can't do both. It's essential as well, I think, to act quickly but thoroughly. You may be in a situation where the SRA and perhaps even the Sisters Disciplinary Tribunal are involved. Um, sometimes, of course, if there is already a Sisters Tribunal decision, you may be able to rely on that, but don't 
take it for, for granted that you're going to be able to rely on the SRA's investigation or the STT to do your coverage investigation for you. Even in seemingly the most straightforward of cases, um, the SDT and the SRA seem to work incredibly slowly. If the claim involves potentially a series of transactions that may have involved dishonesty on the part of an insured, as Adrian's highlighted, you also need to be thinking about aggregation as part of your coverage investigation. That is rarely straightforward. Adrian's highlighted a couple of cases where uh, the court ruled that uh, aggregation did not apply. But if dishonesty is involved across a number of transactions, this may strengthen an argument that there is what's called a series of related transactions, which then aggregate under the MTC. Um, if you are providing cover for the claim, don't forget about your rights of recovery against the dishonest partner and potentially against third parties as well, particularly, for example, where there has been a theft of client money. Um, if there is a prospect of making recovery, then you normally need to act swiftly. Um, and of course, if you become aware of evidence of a real risk of assets being dissipated by the dishonest partner, then you need to think about going to the court to get yourself a quick freezing injunction to preserve the position whilst your claim is being decided. So I hope that's been helpful and giving you a flavour not only of what dishonesty is, but also the coverage implications as well. I should just highlight that we're going to be doing a separate session a little bit later on in the year, which is going to focus very much on coverage investigations uh, and some really good practical hints and tips about how to run them. Um, so I'm not going to say anything more about that now, but I did just want to kind of hopefully open this up for questions. And uh, uh, Harriet, have we got any questions that have come in whilst we've been speaking? Yes, we have. And we have a little bit of time to deliver them. So uh, one question that's come in, if insurers decline cover, can the insured challenge that decision? Um, the answer to that is yes, um, they can. That challenge is normally made by way and, and heard and determined by way of arbitration. Um, occasionally, uh, the challenge will get heard by the court. Are probably also worth highlighting that if your insured is insolvent or becomes insolvent, then the, there is a possibility as well of the claimant challenging your decision on cover using the mechanisms available to them under the Third Party Rights Against Insurers Act. Thank you. Um, just one, one more. If, if the claimant's solicitors know that showing dishonesty in the pleadings might have an impact on cover, why would they allege it? Uh, that's a really good question. Yeah, and why, they do it all the why, time. <laughs> why indeed? I, I think the answer to that is because an allegation of dishonesty, firstly, it opens up a number of other causes of action in addition to negligence. So it may be dishonest breach of fiduciary duty. Um, it may be procuring a breach of contract. It may be the tort of deceit. I mean, there are others as well. The point about using some of those causes of action is that it potentially opens up the scope of damages that are recoverable and also the extent to which damages are recoverable over and above what you could perhaps get in a, in a negligence case. So um, to give you an example, if you've got a case for dishonest breach of fiduciary duty, um, you can't reduce damages necessarily on the basis of contributory negligence if the claim was just pleaded that way. I think it's also fair to say that some claimants solicitors include dishonesty allegations because I think they feel that it ups the ante, that it's more likely to put pressure on the insured and perhaps insurers to settle. I think in my experience, in fact, probably the opposite is true, is that actually making allegations of dishonesty um, make things far more complicated I think, understandably, insureds feel very strongly um, about being accused of dishonesty and far more likely to want to defend the claim through to trial. There are, of course, cases where um, you know, the, the evidence points to dishonesty such that I think it is inevitable that it is pleaded. But I think as a tactical ruse, um, it doesn't have the benefit that perhaps some claimants listeners think it does. So perhaps a bit like Russian roulette. Indeed. Yeah, absolutely. 
Well, we've actually come out of time for uh, any more questions. So I'll pass the baton back to you, Neil, to close up. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Um, that's all that we've got time for for now. Um, uh, if we've missed any questions and you've submitted them in the chat box, we will do our very best to respond to them over the next couple of days by email. Um, thank you for joining us. Please do complete the feedback form that will appear on your screens when we sign off, including the bit about how you'd like to kind of receive these seminars going forward. Kind of we're exploring kind of hybrid options and, and all kinds of things at the moment. Also, any topics that you'd like to see uh, covered in future sessions. I know that our next session is going to be on Thursday, the 16th of June at 11 a.m. When I know that we've got Peter Davis from our, uh, sorry, Neil Davis from our London team and Peter Wedge from Swiss Re. They're going to be focusing on cyber and what that looks like from a reinsurance perspective. So we hope that you'll all join us again then. And in the meantime, have a great rest of the day. Bye bye.